Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Channel 781 News Waltham City Council debrief. This week in the City Council, uh, there was a discussion of Uma Flowers' application to open a cannabis dispensary in Waltham. Councillor has introduced two resolutions, one having to do with dog parks and one having to do with organizing. And um, we will talk about all of those issues. I'm here with James Krakelis and Chris Gamble. Oh. And also, uh, this past week, the city of Waltham announced that June 25th is the date that Waltham's single-use plastic bag ban will go into effect. So we have uh, additional guests, a special guest here to talk to us tonight, and that's Michael Cavallo. Hi, Michael. Hello. Glad to join you. Thanks. And actually, we're going to talk about the bag things first, because um, we think that's a really interesting thing. And I'm going to turn it over to Chris. Can you give us a little background, Chris? Definitely. Um, so this is exciting for me, because this is some one of the first things I ever worked on in Waltham uh, from a community organizing uh, aspect was with Michael. Was, was it more than four years ago? Was that four years ago? Um, put, Yeah, putting together a ban on plastic bags. Um, and so I'm excited to have this conversation, but I'll let uh, Michael, you do talking. Can you give us an overview about what this legislation actually does? Sure. Um, one of the, what this legislation does is say you can't use single use plastic bags anymore. Uh, this follows on the footsteps of a number of other Massachusetts communities uh, so that um, stores would have to instead provide uh, recyclable paper bags, or you could bring in your own cloth and canvas bags. Uh, what it does is it cuts down on carbon emissions because plastic bags are from petrochemicals. Uh, and it also prevents certain waste problems with plastic getting into the environment, particularly the marine environment. So uh, it does a lot of good for the, for the earth. I remember the first public hearing that we had for that. Um, it was, I think Nick Hammond spoke on it. I spoke on it. And then there were a couple of partners from the Sierra Club that spoke on it. That was years ago. That was three years ago, um, which is crazy to think about. Um, so that leads into my next question, which is, you know, this grew from four years of activism and pushing the city council and should be regarded as a victory. Do you want to talk a little bit about, um, you know, the history of the campaign to ban plastic bags in Waltham? Sure, it, it's a big victory. It is, a, it is a, um, very unfortunate. It took so long. One of the reasons is that we had a real advocate in the Ordinance Committee, Robert Logan, who then was defeated for re-election. And so we didn't have a, somebody really pushing it in ordinances. Um, another problem was that even after the city council supported it unanimously, uh, like all ordinances, it went to the legal department and then it sat in legal forever uh, and with, with no way to pry it out of there. You would have uh, needed a lot of work by the city council to get it out. We kept putting pressure on the city council and finally they got it out of uh, legal. And, and one, one of the reasons it was able to stay in there so long is of course COVID happened and froze activity on a lot of important issues. Um, but we finally got it out of legal, and then the city council amended it, which meant that it was back to legal. Fortunately, it didn't stay a whole other year there. Uh, but the city council made two, uh, well, made a couple of changes, uh, which delayed things, but also made the bill a little bit worse. Still a very good bill, and, and we're still really happy it got through. Um, when the city council um, tried to amend it the first time, you know, before it went to legal for a year they tried to carve out an exemption for restaurants. And we were able to defeat that by going into the ordinance committee hearings and um, letting them know that that would exempt you know, some very large providers of plastic bags and really nullify a lot of the good of it. Um, this time when they, uh, and we won, we won that, we got that overturned unanimously. Um, but this time when they tried to amend it this other way, one was by postponing it, uh, uh, the six month delay, and also by allowing these so-called uh, biodegradable bags, plastic bags, which industry contends are biodegradable, but most scientists say isn't the case. 
we decided not to fight that because we really wanted to get most of it through immediately and that it wasn't worth fighting that particular battle. Um, but, you know, we had provided to the city council information on why that wasn't a good solution. And they didn't really deal with the issues. They just said, well, some people say that this, the, these, these biodegradable bags aren't really biodegradable, but we're gonna do this anyway. <laughs> so it was, it was sort of that level of thought. Can you talk about the the tactics that were used for the campaign over these four years? Like, how did you make this successful? Because you know, we can do we can want to do anything, but it actually takes organizing to get things done. Can you talk a little bit about that? About what um, you guys right. did so done? Part, the main tactic we used was trying to get our membership to write um, emails to the various city councilors, um, and that you know certainly has an effect. Um, the other thing we did was coalition with other groups. So Mothers Out Front was very good on this issue. And as you mentioned, the Sierra Club got involved too, which was also very good. Uh, what happens though, is when it takes so long, you know, if, 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 if progressive measures get opposed outright, then you can build up, up uh, you can build up a campaign. But what, when they slow walk it, then it becomes really problematic. It's a really good tactic uh, for, for the bad team of uh, saying, we're not opposing this, we're, we're in favor, but then it just never happens. And so what we, we did was, you know, we, we would get these email campaigns going, we would get these alliances going, um, and then you just have to be very patient and persistent and not get discouraged. Because it's very easy to get discouraged when it's slow walk, you're putting in effort and nothing's happening and nothing's happening and nothing's happening. So uh, it was really great when we got it done the last council meeting of the old council. I'm very happy to see it done. I mean, it took four years. This is a very popular piece of legislation. So there's so much precedent set. I don't understand why the law department had to sit in it for so long. But that's that's for a different discussion. Um, is there anything you would have done differently to make this process quicker? Um, any lessons learned about organizing a mall fam? I guess uh, um, if I, you know, if I if I had a time machine to go back, then I would have realized just how much they could delay that that was not something that ever occurred to me and i guess i would have been more impatient uh, and rather than you know assuming goodwill and assuming okay it got passed why why wouldn't it go through uh, i guess we would have pushed her to get it out legal quicker rather than thinking oh it's moving along as it should so that was sort of a mistake if, we, if, we, if i knew better uh how long they can hang it out uh, uh, would have been more impatient. Um, and, 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 and you do, you do. At least we we kept at it. The persistence worked. It was hard to be persistent because you do get discouraged when nothing happens. Yeah, you talk about um, you talked about Robert Logan and um, him and I had our differences, but uh, the most important thing anyone's ever taught me about the Waltham City Council was Robert Logan, and he said. <laughs> that nothing passes in the Waltham City Council unless it's done through overwhelming public pressure. And, uh, that's, and that's something I will remember forever. Um, so uh, is there anything we can and other environmental groups in Waltham working on right now that you wanna share? And also, can you tell us about we can uh, because we never actually got to that introduction. Okay, sure. Uh, we can was both a, uh, the uh, climate group of Progressive Waltham and also the Waltham group of 350 Mass. Uh, and so we work on statewide environmental issues since 350 Mass. Um, I became chair uh, you know, around the time we started working on the plastic bag ban. Um, we're mostly volunteers. We have about 130 people, but it's, um, you know, we only have a few that really do a lot of the work and we'd like to push that up. So if any of the listeners would like to join in, uh, we, we can really use help. Uh, the more people that are pushing on climate issues, the more success we'll have. And so in terms of other issues, um, we had another couple of successes besides uh, the plastic bag ban. We had uh, community electricity aggregation passed, which give the city bargains on behalf of all the households. And so instead of getting a take it or leave it from the electric utility, we get a much better rate uh, and we get 10% more renewables 
than in than previously than in the state uh, mandated amount, with also the option for people like me to uh, uh, choose 100% renewables at a higher price. People that are willing to prioritize renewables instead of price uh, could go to 100% or 50% renewables. But even the people that wanted to take the basic deal um, not only would get 10% more renewables, but they'd also get this uh, much lower price and also have it last for longer. So instead of having prices jumping up with what's going on with Russian oil, um, they're locked in. So that was another success. Another success was getting Waltham to hire a, a person with sustainability responsibilities. But in terms of looking forward, we'd, we'd like to get a pilot program on uh, composting. Uh, Jonathan Pass, you mentioned earlier, has some great proposals on improving uh, mass transit. So for example, bus shelters, um, that's also uh, an, uh, a class income issue. You know, people that don't that either can't afford or don't choose to have cars, um, you know, having conditions much better for them when they're waiting for the bus and particularly during the winter. Um, so that's good. And also looking forward to uh, tree protection ordinances. We'd also like to get more electrical vehicles and more support for that, both in terms of uh, city-owned vehicles being electric and also in terms of charging stations for people that uh, choose to buy electric vehicles. And you guys are coming to the library uh, with Mother's Not Front soon, aren't you? That's right. We're going to be speaking. Uh, it's a, there's an Earth Day theme. We'll, we'll be speaking Sierra Club and Mother's Out Front. So that's very exciting. Definitely. I was telling the guys that you were uh, it's like you're doing a press tour right now. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so what are some other things Waltham could be doing to mitigate the effects of climate change? Just a wish list. Well, I mean, there's a lot that you can do in terms of improving um, insulation, improving lighting with LED lights. Uh, um, so what you want to do is both energy efficiency and using uh, more renewables. And, and in terms of renewables, you can do things like uh, community LEDs, or, or you can do more with rooftop solar. Well, that's wonderful. Well, uh, thank you for coming, Michael. Um, I think uh, your work at Weekend is awesome. I think that, you know, four years is a long time for this to pass, and I'm glad that we're finally having a meeting where we're celebrating instead of talking about it more. Um, but again, thank you for coming. Yeah, a pleasure to be here, and thanks for doing the show. Uh, I really think it's great to have a group talking about what the council does and doesn't do and keep the focus on it. So good work. Thank you Thank all. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, Michael. That's a pretty big accomplishment, and uh, it's exciting to hear about what that group has planned, given the track record. And I also want to give a shout out to our good friend, Nick Hammond, who is also very involved in this effort and we can, but he wasn't able to, to join us today. We'll talk about our next issue, which is the two, two resolutions um, that Councillor Pass submitted. One has to do with dog parks, and I don't remember who we said was going to talk about this, so I'm going to try J James. Chris. I can do it, yep. There were two resolutions that came out of the city council um, that were both late file. We, were, we went in thinking that there was going to be none. Um, so the first one was dog parks. Um, Councilor Paz, he, uh, he wants to pilot... Um, Da, uh, the idea of a dog park at three different locations um, with the hopes of uh, just putting it anywhere. Um, but right now he's going to look at McKenna, uh, Chemistry, and Nipper Mar Park. Um, those are all relatively center of the city. Um, and uh, so, I mean, you know, uh, I don't know the history of dog parks in Waltham. I, you know, there's the, there's the one on the north side. Um, but I think having one centrally located would be great. Um, so this goes to committee. We will see. I honestly, on those three that were listed, McKenna, Chemistry, and Nippermar, I really don't can't see how it's going to work there. But it could lead to something. I'm excited about that. I'm happy Glad to have a dog park in Waltham that is more centrally located. I'll say that instead of having uh, to go to the um, to the old high school. Anything to add, James? I will say I live kind of close to chemistry and there's a lot of people on the south side with dogs walking them all the time. And I can imagine people would probably want to use it. 
Thanks. And so the uh, second uh, resolution had to do with housing. And uh, who wants to explain that one? Well, I can take it. So this okay, is also, go for it, James. This is also a late file. And it was, we were just talking in the last uh, meeting about how the needs of like homeowners and, and such tend to get centered in these meetings. And this was interesting because it also tend, was a resolution that meant brought up uh, tenants. Uh, the exact wording of it was, um, bear with me here. Uh, the the for resolve was that the uh, Waltham City Council explores all ways to more formally assist tenants, homeowners, and landlords. And that went to economic and community development. Uh, it's hard for me to see what exactly is going to be the action taken from this, but it sounds like it's going to be mostly discussion. And uh, the previous action the city has done on things like this during COVID were uh, rental assistance, which was just a function of payout to the landlords to keep people in. So uh, that's kind of about what I'd be expecting at the, at the high end. So, yeah, I'm, I'm curious. I'm curious what happens. The therefore be resolved, which is like the action step, is incredibly vague, and generally you want something more concrete. I don't know if um, Councilor Paz uh, or any of the other people that signed on have something in mind that they just want to flesh out more in committee, or if they're literally just want to start a conversation. Um, but uh, Hena Beva from Watch, uh, which is a great organization, was also there. So I assume she's working on this. Um, and if anything she works on, I, I enjoy. Um, so I am very curious to see where this goes. It is an economic and community development. So it's un, uh, so it will go unrecorded, but we will record it ourselves and put it online. Um, and, you know, I'm cautiously optimistic. These things get talked about all the time and nothing happens, but I would like to see something happen. Uh, yeah, so um, when he introduced it, he made comments where he talked about um, the high price of housing um, in Waltham and how that affects different groups of people. And that's great because we've been complaining about how no one ever talks about that and he did it. Um, based on those comments that he made when he was uh, introducing it, do we have any speculation on the kind of action he might be hoping to see? I mean, Paz has always been a champion of tenants, and I think for him to put something together that says tenants, owners, and landlords, I'm not sure how much this is supposed to help landlords, but we'll see. He's also a people pleaser. The uh, Some of the sign-ons for it were uh, Darcy, O'Brien, and Dunn as well, and I mean, the it's kind of a, a broad array of people, and they I would be inclined to expect some kind of like rental system as assistance payout being the way that this is structured, um, just because it's a little, it's more, it's not very threatening to the existing structures and makes sure that landlords get paid, but it keeps people in place at least. So. Yeah, people like O'Brien and Dunn, they will make sure that uh, maybe that's why they're there to make sure that the landlords get included. Okay. Wait, and also you mentioned, Chris, that there was something. Um, unusual that happened when he introduced one of the resolutions with Councillor Cates, right? Well, it was just strange going back to the first resolution uh, because they, they say the whole resolution, the whole rigmarole, and then they say uh, signed and then all of the people, and this one was only paused. And he says, oh, I think one other councillor did. And then there was just like crickets in the room. And then all you hear is Councillor Cates and what seven, you're like, uh, no, I'm not ready to sign on to that. And so it's just interesting to me because sometimes counselors will not share a resolution. So only their name is put onto it. And then some, and then most of the time they put it out to all of the counselors. So anyone can sign on. So when someone puts out uh, a resolution that only has their name on it, 99 times out of 10, maybe not, maybe that's a little uh, hyperbole, but generally, it's because they didn't want anyone else to sign on because they wanted it to be, you know, about them, um, which is, you know, there's pros and cons to that. Um, and this one in particular, by pause saying that, it makes it seem like he did put it out to anyone, everyone, and no one else wanted to sign on. So it's like, it's just a weird moment in the uh, city council. 
it could also be because it was a late file that there was like fewer Very people true. signing on. Because a lot of these late files, you'll see people just signing on as they're reading it in the room in the first yeah, place. Yeah, we have seen that. Good point, James. Literally on the fly being like, I will sign on to this. Um, so yeah, it was a late file done after Thursday um, before Monday four. Okay. So uh, the vast majority of last night's meeting was taken up by the discussion of Uma Flowers' uh, application for a special permit to open a dispensary in uh, Waltham that would be both um, uh, a medical as well as an adult use dispensary. Um, they had a public hearing as part of last night's meeting and they already had a public hearing over a year ago. That was the first step in getting their special permit. And the reason they requested a new hearing is because since then, the membership of the council have changed. Um, we've added two new counselors, so uh, they wanted to do their presentation for them. And um, so it was a long conversation, about 100 minutes. A lot of it was going over what Uma is planning to do uh, with their shop. And I'm not going to summarize that because they, we've, we've discussed it before. And actually, um, one of the people who spoke last night was our good friend, Emily Superior. So I want to give her a shout out. She's one of the people who has helped me keep up to date on this issue. And we made a video uh, where we went up to uh, Uma Flower's current location in Pepperell. So if you're interested in this issue, but you've never been to a dispensary and you're having trouble envisioning how they work, you can check out that video on uh, the Waltham Data YouTube channel or on Grouches of Waltham. Um, so last night, uh, it was interesting because their stated reason for being there was for the two new counselors to get the presentation. So that kind of put the attention on our two new counselors, uh, Bradley McCarthy and Cates. And in particular, it was the first time we've really heard um, Councillor Bradley MacArthur uh, speak for a significant amount of time in the council. And I thought she did a really, she came across really well. She did not seem nervous at all. She did not rush through her questions. She did seem like she had always been sitting in that seat. So I wanted to mention that. This was another opportunity for the councillors to ask questions. And those two asked most of the questions, both Councillor Lefauti and Councillor um, LeBlanc ask questions that they weren't very negative, but they both sort of brought up the fact that there's residential nearby this location, which sort of implying they might have an issue with that. Councillor Bradley McCarthy did uh, a really interesting thing with her questions. I think she wanted to be supportive. And so what she did was she asked some questions that gave the, uh, the petitioners um, opportunities to say some positive things about their business. One of her questions to the petitioners was, um, you know, what has been your experience uh, as women um, entrepreneurs in this industry, which is very heavily male dominated. And, and they had an interesting answer for that. So I appreciate that she brought that up because, you know, she didn't bring, she didn't rock the boat in terms of trying to change the process, but she did rock the boat in terms of bringing up some things that don't usually get brought up. Um, so Councillor Cates also asked a lot of questions. He asked some very pointed, critical kind of questions so that at first it almost seems like he he was a, looking for a reason to be against it. Um, but as it went on, it, it became more clear that he was just, he's not against it. He was just being very detail oriented in terms of bringing up every possible concern his, his constituents might have. So for example, he asked them, well, are you going to sell edibles? And how are we going to make sure that doesn't up, end up in the candy food stream? And um, so the uh, lawyer explained that um, it's actually illegal to make edibles that look too much like candy. It's illegal to package them in a way that looks like candy. And then Kate says, well, but here's the thing, uh, most medicine tastes bitter. So if a kid accidentally eats it, they know it's something they're not supposed to eat, but this is something that tastes sweet. And the lawyer pointed out that if somebody's, um, uh, being treated for cancer and they've lost their appetite and they need to use cannabis to get their appetite back. They need to eat something appetizing. They can't, you can't make it gross. So it was those type of questions where it was uh, things that maybe to people who are more familiar with legal cannabis did, uh, weren't that interesting, but would be interesting to people who have questions about this. And uh, so 
as far as I can tell, uh, this hearing had no effect on the process. So when uh, Uma Flowers and the other four to five applicants submitted their applications, each of them submitted a traffic study. And um, the all of those uh, applications are now in front of the Rules and Ordinances Committee, which has asked the city to perform another traffic study. And that's what everybody's waiting on. And we can't do anything uh, to speed that up. And it doesn't appear that this hearing did anything to speed that up. But that raises the question of what was their intention with this hearing? Was it really, did, did they really expect that two new counselors would somehow change the process? And I think maybe uh, Uma's lawyer was hoping that they would make such a good impression that the council, in fact, would say, we're going to go ahead and grant this permit um, without waiting for that traffic study. And this came up when Councillor Darcy questioned them. He is the head of the Rules and Ordinance Committee. And um, he asked kind of an odd question. He asked the lawyer, um, when that new traffic study comes out, are you going to consider it? But they're not the ones who are making a decision. It's the council making a decision. So it wasn't clear what he meant that he are you going to consider it? Um, but the lawyer said, oh yeah, of course we'll consider it. And then Darcy said, it, um, the reason we asked to do that, and this is important because I've been speculating about it for a long time. Darcy says the reason that they um, wanted to do the traffic study was because the traffic studies they got from each of the applicants were very inconsistent and made very different predictions about the traffic. Um, so that's why they want to do the additional one to understand those discrepancies. And he said it in a maybe slightly defensive way, like he was picking up that the lawyer wanted to um, challenge that. Um, the lawyer did not directly push back on the traffic study at all, but he made a comment um, that he has a secret fantasy uh, that they will uh, approve him without the traffic. So that was his way of raising it without appearing to be criticizing the council's process. Um, so it was interesting in a lot of ways. Um, if uh, you're not familiar with what's going on, whom I suggest watching it. Um, but for those people who have been following the story, unfortunately, I don't think this meeting had any effect on the process. Um, everybody's just still waiting on that traffic study. Um, Chris, did you have any other thoughts on that? Uh, my only thought is that I'm, I'm like so bored of talking about this. Um, it's because, you know, Waltham said yes to recreational uh, weed, which I guess we're calling adult use now, which is fine, I'll start calling it adult use. Um, in 2016, like that is a extraordinarily long time. It took us four years to ban plastic bags. It's taking us eight years to figure out how to set up a, a weed shop. And then, you know, there are other cities that are just raking in dough, um, talk about frugality. Um, and, you know, I'm just, this I learned almost nothing new from this public hearing. It's was it just a general hearing, just like the last time they were here. And I was just, I'm just, I just want to just be done with it. Yeah, I I find this an interesting issue, but I but I still felt like this was an extremely long meeting to not accomplish that much, other than here getting to hear Colleen talk, <laughs> for, <laughs> which was good. James, did you have thoughts? I thought it was really funny when Randy was asking how long it takes edibles to take effect and also like the whole like bringing up like you know edibles being sweet or whatever is kind of funny too just because like there's plenty of alcohol that is like fruit flavored or like sweet or whatever you know it's very much a double standard like people mentally have I guess like between like all the different drugs that are legal and stuff but yeah Randy you can also just go I guess to the store to ask and stuff like this too. <laughs> Yeah, if um, I I totally forgot, I should have mentioned that that legendary moment where Randy was like the, the at large city, the most popular at large city councilor asked, uh, "How long does it take edibles to kick in?" If you could include that clip on this video, that would be amazing. If, if somebody comes in and purchases edibles um, and was to take one, what is the timeline of a? Let's say they took one and they were driving. What is the timeline of effects that the it, it takes place on? Um, why do you think he asked that? Because he's never eaten an edible in his life, I assume. The uh, context of the question, I think, is like uh, if say, say someone's hypothetically buys a bunch of edibles and eats them all in the parking lot, will that in interfere with them getting home? And it's like you can do the exact same thing in a liquor store. 
So, yeah, and um, you know, the lawyer basically to a, he responded really well to a lot of those kinds of questions by making analogies like um, James just made about well, compare this how to a liquor store, compare this to other types of retail businesses, and in fact, he made the point several times that cannabis dispensaries attract less traffic than other types of retail businesses. And he went into detail about why that is with pre-orders and stuff. And um, so this whole issue of the traffic study, do you need one of them? Do you need two of them? It still begs the question of why are you treating a pot shop any differently than another business in, in terms of traffic? He also mentioned that as part of this process, they had met with the city's traffic engineer, made changes to their plans. And then he said, I'm totally okay with this. At least according to Uma's lawyer, he said he was totally okay with it. So this process is of waiting for this traffic study is on top of already having the traffic engineer's approval. So uh, I thought the, the lawyer did a great job of addressing a lot of the concerns. He also addressed what you just said, Chris, about why are we calling it adult use instead of recreational? He pointed out there are a lot of people who want to use uh, cannabis medicinally, but for one reason or another, they don't want to get a medical card because that puts them in a database of cannabis users. And some people have federal jobs and that's still illegal under federal law. So that's why they say adult use because not everyone who's coming in that way is using it recreationally. So I think that's that's all on the on the pot shops that have been discussed for a very long time. Any additional comments? No. So, yeah. <laughs> So thank you very much. Uh, I'm really glad we had Michael on because that's a real that was a really um, helpful story of a success story of organizing in Waltham. And um, tell all your friends to watch this episode so they can do the same thing with their organizing. And uh, we will be back next week with the city council committee meetings. Thank you very much. Hi everyone. <laughs>